uh, what I'm going to do in the next, uh, in the last part of the talk is I'm going to talk about uh, uh, neural networks as they were designed to solve vision problems. And in that, uh, the, that model is going to be even closer to how the brain is solving vision by itself and the model that we talked about earlier. And I'm going to start, uh, and at the end I'm going to talk about just, you know, uh, just put some vignettes of other applications and the uh, successes of deep learning algorithms that are not related to computer vision, uh, but just a bit. So um, I'm going to start again with this ImageNet competition. <coughs> And again, we have these 14 million uh, images that were labeled and people are competing every year. And since 2013 or 2012, every winning algorithm is using, heavily using deep learning. Yes? How did they, did they uh, label the, the images? I mean, humans did it. Human did it. Yes, human labor, like the pyramids. Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> people said. And yes, okay. yes. That's true. And limited to neural networks? The entries in the competition? No, no, no. It's just that it happens that no one is trying anything else right now. What? OK. It's, it's, no, it's, it's just, I don't know if no one is trying anything else right now, but it's not, it's, it's not in the chart. Everything else is, is off the chart. It's basically not in the you know, first 20 places or something like that. So. We want to talk about, so in, in the previous network that we talked about, the goal was to reconstruct the input. We learned meaningful stuff. We wanted to know what's the essence of the input so that basically we did this uh, information bottleneck approach. We needed to find the best information that we can extract from the input so that we can reconstruct it. But we don't care about that when we're doing computer vision. All we care about is telling, you know, we, we get uh, an image that could be maybe, you know, 500 pixels by 500 pixels. So we get these, uh, uh, how, many, how many elements are that? 500 squares, like 250,000? 25,000. 25, we only care about 1,000. So we want, if you care about 1,000 classes, all we care about is 1,000 bits. We want to know if that object class is in the picture or it, if it's not, okay? So it's a different network. And if I want to learn that network, so I'm building this, this network that I'm gonna talk about in, in a second. But the first thing that I want to, uh, do in order to model the problem, and that's always the first thing when I'm using deep learning, is to think about the loss function. What am I trying to optimize? So this, this is what this final layer is doing. So whatever this is computing, the final layer is gonna be the probability <coughs> that, sorry, why the probability? In order to use deep learning, we have, we have to make it differentiable. We can't have the output layer be one for the correct answer and zero for all the rest. And then, and then you know, anything else in between is like a penalty. We have to find a way to differentiate the problem. And that's why we're asking the network to uh, report the probability that it thinks that a specific object class is in the image. And then the penalty that we're gonna use is the LAN, like the, the, the natural log for the penalty. That means that if you are 100% sure that this picture has a boat, then LAN of one is gonna be Zero. LAN of one is zero. Okay? So no penalty. If you're 100% sure that this is, and by the way, we're normalizing at the end, so this all sums to one. Right? So it's not, it's just another layer in the computational graph. So it doesn't have to be the, the old fashioned nuance. We could have a layer that takes the previous layer and normalizes it, so it sums up to one. It's a differential operation. We can do it. So that's the last layer here. It just, it just, it just normalizes it, so it sums to one. So those are probabilities now. And if we think that this is about by 50% chance, then we pay a penalty of LAN of 50, which is about 0.7. And if we think that there is only 1% that this is about, the penalty goes down to, goes up to 4.6, okay? So this is the penalty that we're paying for every misclassification, because there's not really misclassification. We're always gonna give some probability to every class, but the higher probability we give to the correct class, the less penalty that we're gonna get, okay. So now I'm gonna tell you what these layers are doing. <coughs> and these layers, there are two types, of the, uh, uh, two types here, and the first type of layer that uh, is used in uh, computer vision networks is the convolution layer. So convolution, what is a convolution? So think of a convolution, um, okay. 
this, this three by three matrix over here, that's what's called the convolution kernel. What we're gonna do is we're gonna treat this as like this, this vector that we're gonna put on top of the original image. So we're starting by putting this three by three matrix on top of this three by three matrix, and we're multiplying each value to the corresponding value, okay? So in this case, all the values are zeros, so we are multiplying, multiplying this four by this zero and this minus four by this two. So the result is minus eight, and we're writing it down. And then the next thing we're doing is that we're gonna shift the kernel one step to the right, and we're gonna do the exact same computation one step to the right. And then forward, and then forward, and then forward, and so on, and so on. So it's gonna be like this. So if this is the kernel, let's wait for it to restart. We are basically computing the, the convolution. What it's doing is it's computing each one of these elements by multiplying the kernel values with the image values. Is this clear? The result goes into the center? The result goes into the center. So here is a you know, small, small, small exercise. What's going to be the size? Like how many outputs is this uh, uh, you know, image going to have? if we apply this kernel, all, all of the you know, possible values on the original box, on the original matrix. So the original matrix is seven by seven, and the kernel is three by three. I hear four by four, five by five. Five by five, why five by five? Because it's stuck, right? We can't, we can't have the center be here. This because <coughs> we have to pad it with zeros or something if you want to do, we want to do that. And sometimes we do it, by the way. But in this particular case, we're not. So we're limited. And, and this 5 by 5 turned to be 3 by 3 when we apply the 3 by 3 kernel. OK, here is another exercise. So this was just one kernel. And here, we're taking the input volume. OK, and the input volume is, is an image of 32 by 32 by four, so it's not an image. It's some random layer of the neural network. And that random layer of the neural network has 32 by 32, so there, there are 32 by 32 by four volumes, okay? You can think of it as an image that has four dimensions, okay? And we're applying a kernel, and the kernel right now is not flat. The kernel is three by three by four, because it has to have the same depth as the original input volume. What's going to be the output volume right now? So we're going to have five kernels, right? Each one of these kernels is going to build one slice in the output volume. What's going to be the size of that slice? So each kernel, each 3 by 3 by 4 kernels, is moved along a 32 by 32 input volume. What's going to be the, the size? It doesn't, move in, it doesn't move in the depth, uh, in the depth area because it's already filling the depth. Yes, okay. So it's only move, it moves exactly like the kernel over there moved. So it moves only uh, down and to the right. It's, it's going to be 30 by 30, right. This is going to be 30 by 30. But why do we have like a big depth? This is not to scale. The, the, there are only this, this, length is, this depth is five, because, we have fi because I'm using five kernels, not just one. Okay. okay? Why am I using five kernels? Because every kernel that I'm using is a feature, OK? If I'm using one kernel, it means that I'm looking for one feature of the data, OK? Maybe the kernel, for example, represents a line in a particular, uh, in a particular uh, angle. If I'm moving, if, if this, for example, three by three uh, um, matrix is going to have one here, one here, and one here, then the resulting matrix, the resulting image of the convolution, is going to be all the places in the original image that had the line right there in that particular angle. So it's a feature detector. And we don't only want the neural network to you know, apply just one feature. We want it to apply as many features as possible, or you know, a lot of features. So in this case, five. But you can imagine this being you know, 100, 200, 300. So what's the output volume? So 3 by 3 on a 32 by 32 is going to give us 30 by 30. And the output volume is, and, and the depth is going to be 5 because we used 5 kernels. OK? So 3, 30 by 30 by 5. How many parameters do we have here? So this, what I'm describing right now is what the convolutional layer is doing. Sorry. What the convolutional layer is doing. How many parameter, parameters do we have right here? So we have 5 kernels. Each one of these kernels 
is 3 by 3 by 4. Right? Sorry? So 3 by 3 by 5 by 4. And we also have the biases that the, each, for each one of the kernels. So we had plus 5. Okay? And the cool part about that, and that relates to the question that was asked from that direction regarding uh, how we are able to tell whether a face is here or here or here in the image. We're basically using the exact same feature detector. We're just moving it along the image. So this kernel is basically computing the exact same response all over the place. OK, so basically we're a translation invariant. That's the, uh, that's the term for that. But at the price that the features you detect are localized. Sorry? The features you detect here are localized. Yeah, by definition. Ah. They are, yes. They are localized by definition. But uh, so, so these are the number of parameters that we have for this particular uh, convolution. And we have some hyperparameters. So when we are deciding that a particular convolution uh, layer in the neural network is going to be a convolutional layer, we can choose other things. We can choose, for example, the width and the height of the kernel. It doesn't have to be a 3 by 3 kernel. It could be a 5 by 5 kernel, 10 by 10 kernel, and so on. And of course, the depth, the depth of uh, the kernel, mean, meaning the number of kernels that we're using. The stride, we don't, only ha we don't have to always move just one step to the right. We can move two steps to the right. We can move three steps to the right. Okay, so we have this freedom to choose a convolutional layer with all these hyperparameters. And don't ask me what's the right answer, what's the right, number of, um, what's the right number of stride, or what's the right size of the kernel. It's all based on, you know, it, this, this, the answer will change every year, basically. This is another type of layer that we have in a image and in the image classification network. The second type of layer is the max pooling layer. And that's basically uh, doing subsampling of the image. It takes the result of every single kernel, so every slice in, the, in this volume represents the output of one of the kernels that were applied in the previous layer. Okay, so we have one slide, one slice per, per kernel, and then we subsample it. We divide this slice to these tiles of two by two, and we take the maximum of each, of each uh, two by two, uh, you know, each, each two by two tiles. So if this was one of the outputs of a particular kernel, this would be the result of max pooling. We just take the maximum. So for example, if one of the kernels was computing a line in a particular angle, now this, the result of this, this uh, um, layer is going to make us a little bit more robust to changes uh, in translation. Right? If we move this, uh, this line a little bit, the next neuron is going to fire, which is fine because this max pooling is going to grab the next neuron as well into the same, into the same batch, so into <coughs> the same output. Now, what's the result of applying max pooling? It basically halves the dimensions of the input. We have exactly the same depth because we just took every slice and uh, you know, shrunk it by two for every dimension, but the, num the depth stays the same. It's, it's a way to tra also, it's a way to trade off computation with respect to like, the width of the image, but, in the, uh, but the trade off is that we're using more features. We're basically increasing the width, the, the, sorry, the depth of the layer uh, that comes afterwards. So how many parameters in this case? None, because we're just taking the maximum over each 2 by 2 area. And here we also have hyperparameter. We can use 3 by 3 areas. We can have overlapping areas. We can do a lot of other tricks over here. So that's it. This is how a convolutional neural network that, that, that does image classification look like. Usually we have a convolutional layer. Okay, so we take the, uh, the maybe 1,000 by 1,000 image and we apply 20 kernels on it. Each kernel is 5 by 5. Because the kernels are 5 by 5, the, input vo the, the volume of the first layer is 28 by 28 by 20 because we apply 20 kernels. And because we use the 5 by 5 convolution, the 32 by 32 turned into 28 by 28. The same reason, uh, for the reason I, I talked to you before. How did the 5 became uh, 20? How did a 5 became 20? We applied here 20 kernels. We applied this, oh. this convolution layer applies 20 different kernels. And then we're applying max pooling. So we had a 28 by 28 by 20. And now it's 14 by 14 by 20. 
And now we're applying 20 convolutions again, also 5 by 5. So the 14 by 14 becomes 10 over 10. But we still have the depths of 20. But these are different than the ones we, it's not the same kernels. Every kernel is different. Between the layers, ev every layer in every, every kernel in every layer is a different kernel. And we don't know them in advance. We learn all these parameters. And then at some point, we say enough is enough. And we use flatten. If you ever used MATLAB, there is this flatten thing where you take any, any n-dimensional matrix and you make it a s into a single vector. At that point, we lose the spatial uh, information that we had, uh, you know, the, the locality that we had before of the features. We just turn it into a regular uh, layer of a neural network. And then usually we do a couple of uh, fully connected iterations. So we, we add a, f a number of fully connected layers. And then we have the final layer, which is one node per class. And the goal of each node is to compute the probability that that class is in the image. What, what goes on between two fully connected layers? Which function do you apply? It's exactly the first original neural network that I showed. Right. W times X same. times plus B, applying uh, nonlinearity. That would be the classic neural network. So all the way until, until here, we had, uh, we basically used kernel, and we moved these kernels around. And the cool stuff about convolutional neural networks, I ruined that. The cool part about convolutional neural network is that in all these layers, the number of parameters was independent of the picture size. If I increase the picture size, it doesn't matter. I'm using the same kernels, I'm using the same feature detectors. We can, uh, we can apply just the same uh, number of parameters. So it's a very scalable thing. But does it change the, the quality of the, of the prediction uh, significantly? No? It depends. If your image is uh, just zoomed in, then it could change the quality of the predictions because suddenly stuff is going to look bigger to you. But if it's uh, a picture, for example, of uh, you know, a street and, and, and basically you're tiling a lot of uh, uh, you know, areas of the street, or if you're looking at a, at a map or something like that, and it's not, it doesn't change the scale of the object, then it actually does not reduce your performance because the, the way an object would look in a small picture is going to be the same way as it would look in a large picture. So it's, it depends on how your pictures look like. Yeah, for the same picture with a different resolution, with a higher resolution, it could hurt uh, the detection. So again, if, if the object takes uh, you know, five times more space uh, in a different image, and you trained it uh, on a corpus of images that are on low resolution, yes, don't expect to have the best results. You, need to, you may need to subsample your uh, high resolution pictures. One second. OK, so this, I'm not going to go into the details, but this is actually how uh, the neural network that won the 2012 ImageNet competition looked like. So pretty much the same, just in a larger scale. And it used two GPUs, and that's why you see uh, what you see over there. But basically, it did convolution, max pooling, convolution, max pooling, convolution, 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 max pooling, fully connected, done. Seriously, seriously, it, it is easy right now. Because right now we have um, computer, uh, uh, basically packages, libraries that are able to do this with just a few lines of code. And this is, these are the features that it got. And now I'm looking at uh, the more state-of-the-art uh, uh, network. And you can see the features that, that, that it got. So here you see what the, the, what the features are sensitive to. And here you see the actual patches of images that got these features to uh, uh, basically to get activated. So you can see that we have the lines over there, and that's what got the lines activated, really these edge detector things. But then later on, we have circles, and we have squares. And now we're going to layer three, and we have like parts of objects, like wheels, and different textures. And then in layer four and layer five, we're starting to see animals and faces, and flowers, and so on. How do you get, how do you get to ask a node what, it, what it's sensitive to? How do you get? It's not a trivial question at all. That's what the previous paper is about. And also the <coughs> paper at the bottom. You need to, you need to the Zeller and Fergus paper talks about that. You're right, it's not an easy thing. But one thing you can do, 
is this. So what's deep dream? So you remember back propagation, right? When we did back propagation, we did a gradient over, basically we found a gradient over the weights of the neural network. But the back propagation process did not only use, did not only uh, compute the gradient over the weights. It also computed the gradient over the actual input variables. So it computed the gra gradient over everything. And what we did is that we changed just the parameters. We took a gradient step on the parameter space. What Deep Dream is doing is they're taking their gradient space in the input space. So they're training a neural network, they finish training the network, and then they are applying it to uh, you know, real images. I took this one, by the way, from Burning Man. No, sorry, not Burning Man, Midburn. The Israeli Burning Man. The Israeli Burning Man uh, of, of last year. And the previous to, yes, previous to the last one. And uh, <coughs> what, what basically the network is doing is we're asking, if we change the input, not the weight, the input a little bit, would this make the network more excited? Okay, what would make, what would make the network more, more excited? The network wants to see an animal right there. It wants to see uh, you know, this little bird over there. There is a new one that's very excited because it thinks that it sees a bird. So let's change the input so it looks even more like a bird. We're doing gradient descent, not on the weights, on the inputs. That's what we're doing. And they found a way to do it on a particular layer. So this is what happens when you're doing this deep dream thing on the first layer. We're getting these line features because this is exactly what the first layer is sensitive to. Different lines, different angles. So that's how we got that one. And then this is probably the second layer, when we have all these circles. And this is, these are the final layers, and we're seeing the basically parts of animals, and this, this doesn't look tasty, right? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's another way to visualize what the, learn, what the deep network sees. And there are other ways as well. There's a, a just a new tool came out uh, that I just read about yesterday, and there's stuff coming out all the time of how to visualize this thing. But yeah, it's not an easy thing, right? Okay, what's next? So we'll finish with the technical stuff, and now just have a little bit more fun. So we have a neural network. Let's connect it to a different neural network, and we can have a sequence of neural network. <coughs> so here is a neural network that translates a sentence in German to a sentence in English. What happens is that the neural network computes a vector. We don't know what it computes exactly. Sorry. Every time I start talking about a neural network, the first thing you should ask me is what's the loss function? What are you optimizing? Okay? So what I'm optimizing is that the sequence that comes after the German sentence is, is uh, spoken is going to be the correct translation. Every time the, the word is the exact word, uh, basically the probability of the word the, the, that the network gave the correct translation uh, word. And we're making this computational circuit where the network just applies uh, the weights to the previous state after every new word comes. And then at some point, it starts emitting the German words. We can, we can train this thing. As long as it's differentiable, we can train it. And we can uh, give it you know, millions of uh, examples of translated sentences, specifically the protocols <laughs> of the United Nations and the European Union uh, parliaments are really good at this, and you usually have very politically aware uh, translations, which is great. And then we could do something even cooler. We can replace the whole first part, the red part, with a convolutional neural network. So now we have a lot of images on Google that have pictures and then a description of the picture, like a caption. So we can take that picture with the caption and we use a convolutional neural network. What's the last layer of that network? I don't know, I just have a placeholder there for a large vector. And then I'm gonna apply the same idea of you know, making sentences and I'm gonna have the loss function of describing exactly the right caption for the image. And then we have a system that gets a picture as an input and the output is a caption for that image. And this is, these are actual results of a neural network giving you automatic captions to images. How many classes do you have there at the end? How many what? Wow. Like eventually, you're training against classes, right? Like not classes here, on the original, on the previous. Right, so here, because this is open-ended. Oh, 
The classes are the words. You have dictionary words. Every time you give, uh, the probability that you gave to the correct word is the penalty that you're going to get. So potentially you could have, let's say, in Wikipedia, you have 50,000 uh, concepts. So each of those can be a potential target? No, each word, not a concept. Particular word in the dictionary. If you think this is cool, the next slide is going to be amazing. <laughs> this is going from captions to images. We're giving the network a, basically a sentence describing a picture. And the network, it's, it's a little more complicated than the network that I showed you before, because it's a generative network. It's a little different. It paints a picture. Now, these are crappy pictures. It's not yet there. It's like, it's like you know, watching movies online 20 years ago. <laughs> But it's going to get better. Here's an example of what it could do. So this is a very large commercial plane flying in blue skies. And we got these blobs in blue skies. And then you ask it for a very large commercial plane flying in rainy skies. And you get rainy skies with something that looks like a, an airplane in them. And, and it's really good. And they, they uh, watch the best uh, you know, image in the corpus that looks like that. And it's not, it doesn't look like that at all. So, so it, it's actually making new concept, new pictures as it goes along. OK, so what's the future? So the main, uh, goal, the main thing that we learned in this whole deep learning Odys uh, uh, odyssey is that everything that you can differentiate, no matter how deep it is, you can learn. And the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to differentiate things that we don't think are differentiable. We're going to differentiate code. We're going to differentiate computer programs. We're going to function. Uh, we're going to differentiate the reward uh, function of a game. There's a deep network that already knows how to play Atari games really, really well. <laughs> and we're going to differentiate words and sentences and stories. We're going to make everything differentiable so we can learn it. And yeah, then the next concept that's going to come along is a neural Turing machine. We're going to learn a network that is able to interact with memory. It's going to be able to read to memory, to write for memory, to apply an operation on a memory, and it's all going to be. Uh, learned in this approach. So that's it. Oh, sorry, resources. It's almost it. It's very easy to get into this business. Uh, there's an outstanding research community. Everything is online. Everything is published for free. All the papers are free. Uh, there's a huge development community. There is, I don't know, maybe 10 different libraries or 20 different libraries that are state-of-the-art deep learning. And you have them for Python, for C++, for Java for um, Lua, for some reason. Sorry? Lua. Yeah, for Lua. That's actually one of the best ones, the one for Lua. And um, <coughs> almost everything is shared and free. There are tons of tutorials online. If you like the vision stuff about con convolutional neural networks, then uh, Andre Karpati class in Stanford is the way to start. If you like reinforcement learning, how to beat the Atari games and the, and the network that paints the pictures and so on, that's uh, the Oxford class of Nando de Feritas. That's on YouTube. Uh, the Google TensorFlow documentation is a really good one on how to use their software and, in general, about uh, computer, uh, about neural networks. And there's the deep learning net tutorial, which is um, that's got the concept running. This, is, this started in like 2007, even, with the basic uh, element of uh, neural network. So thank you very much. This is it. Oh, and I have a blog if you want to take a look. I don't publish there a lot, but every once in a while uh, there is a nice uh, post over there. Okay, thank you.